My name is Tracy Ellis, and I work for the same department Jim works for, the County Department of Agriculture. And the reason why I'm uh, up here today is to discuss what I found out when I started looking into uh, some of the slug and snail issues that we find when we um, intercept them, mainly out of a concern for our inspectors that are looking, we have 23 inspectors or so for the Department of Agriculture, and they are regularly inspecting plants that come from Hawaii and Florida. And so for us, um, we, I wanted to look into this rat lungworm because we've been hearing a lot about um, Angiostrongylus cantonensis and um, other Angiostrongylus uh, type critters. And the problem is, is that they are associated with rats and snails so either the, sna the rat or the snail can bring the nematode into our area. And rats are ubiquitous. You know rats have been um, spread all around the world in shipping and whatnot. And snails obviously um, get tr transported in a lot of different ways. So um, the rat lungworm, um, it causes a type of meningitis, uh, eosinophilic meningitis, and it basically, in the rat, it lives in the pulmonary arteries and then also goes up to the brain, blood-brain barrier. In people, it goes to the blood-brain barrier and causes a massive headache. And what, there's really no treatment for it. It's called eosinophilic meningitis because there's swelling in the brain because of this irritation. And the um, eosinophils, which are, are sort of like a type of, of blood cell, rise in the bloodstream, and that's how doctors are able to diagnose it. And a lot of doctors aren't familiar with eosinophilic meningitis, and so it's hard for them, um, unless you tell them that you've traveled to a tropical area or that you've eaten something you know, from a tropical area, they might not even think about why you have a bad, bad headache. So the only thing that, that happens with people, if you just have a few of these nematodes, is um, that they let them die in, in your, your regular immune system takes care of them, but it's excruciatingly painful, excruciatingly painful. So uh, they don't want to administer any kind of drug because that would actually cause more complications. So they just let you fight it off yourself. Um, the problem is, is that some of the nematodes, um, they, they, need, they need to have the, the, they, the, the slugs pick it up, the rat eats the slug, the, poop, the rat eat, poops, the nematodes are in the poop, the snail eats the poop of the rat, gets contaminated again, the rat eats the snail, the rat poops, the snail eats the poop. It goes around and around in this poop cycle, okay? <laughs> so um, the problem is, is that uh, these nematodes can, in an aquatic sort of moist environment, they can live in the rat poop for a couple of weeks, or and it, depending on how moist it is. And uh, so that just gives more chance for either rats to eat it, or I mean the snails to eat the rat poop, or the rat to eat the snail poop, or however it goes. So um, now this, from what I read in the rat lungworm disease scientific workshop that occurred in, in Hawaii, is that basically many, many, many different types of amphibians, mollusks, freshwater shrimp, uh, things that live in aquatic, freshwater aquatic systems can carry these nematodes. They can be, they're not the true host, but they can, they can um, basically harbor the nematode for a period of several months uh, until the nematode finds the true host, which is a snail or a rat. And so, Basically, this puts a lot of our aquatic invertebrates at risk, and it puts us at risk, and it puts the whole kind of nation at risk. Um, 
for getting this nematode and um, so it can be in more than just snails and every single, I want to just point out the very top line here, snail hosts, all species of native and exotic terrestrial mollusks can serve as intermediate hosts, okay? So don't think that the barn garden snail can't carry this. It's not been researched very well, but it could possibly, if we had this brought into our environment, get picked up by the brown garden snail. And just this, just to show you that Hawaii and the Caribbean are our main sources for the United States uh, as far as having cases of uh, eosinophilic meningitis in people. And it's either people eating the, uh, the lettuce in, from Hawaii or some of the snails from, um, from the Caribbean. And um, so there in, in the United States, Florida, Mississippi, and Louisiana have apple snails. We actually have apple snails here at Lake Miramar, giant apple snails. Um, I don't believe they've ever been tested to see if they carry the nematode. Um, but people uh, have had cases in all three states. And the main bad characters, the bad actors in these that we know are infected and know that they cause human um, problems are the giant African land snail, the semi-slug, which giant African land, oh, giant African land snail is um, really eaten for food in a lot of Asian countries. Uh, it's huge and it's in Florida and it has been, as our earlier speaker discussed, has been shown positive for carrying the nematode in Florida. And the, uh, like I said, we have this apple snail here uh, in little populations and the semi-slug is rampant in Hawaii and 75% of the semi-slug is, uh, has been found to carry the nematode in Hawaii. So w this is just known hosts of rat lungworm list on the left. And because I was concerned for our inspectors, I put up our list of slugs we collected this year from incoming shipments. And you can see that the semi-slug from Hawaii is one of the ones we've intercepted. That's the one that's been shown to be 75% likely to have the nematode. And our most common snail, Bradybina, that we intercept regularly on, on shipments from Florida um, has been shown in Cuba to be carrier of the um, angiostrongylus. So what, we, what, pe what people think is that when snails share habitat, like the apple snail in Florida crosses path with a Bradybina, which crosses path with a rat, then you have the chance where you can pick up that um, nematode. So the whole reason I did this was to make sure that the inspectors and you all know that, especially if you're visiting tropical countries, uh, you know, don't let your kids play with the snails or slugs um, and use caution on intercepting anything from outside in the uh, shipments from Florida and Hawaii especially. Thank you. Arnold? Any questions for Tracy while she's up here? Yes, Gary. Well, I, they're, they're in dispute about that. Um, I don't think so in they, there's some people that say yes, some people say no. Usually they, they've implicated it as a slime trail, but really what they think happened was that people actually ate very, very small slugs or snails that were not visible. But it's still a warrant's caution in touching the slime trail because there could be nematodes in the slime trail. But usually if you wash your hands quickly after uh, after contact and make sure that it's not transported on your hand to your mouth. 
it's not going to get through your skin. That's one thing for sure. It has to be orally ingested.